I think the essence of this slide and this talk is how we actually move from care spaces to caring systems. We have a lot of discourse around how we improve our hospitals, our practices, our caring institutions. But how do we move on to caring systems? You already, when you think about that, you already notice a slight difference in emphasis. In preparation of this talk, I came across a quote in a newspaper about a young couple that moved to New York City from Dublin. This was around the time I moved to Ireland. So moving to a new country allows you to reinvent yourself. And I paused a little bit to think what that means in terms of our topic today, the transgenerational world. I've moved several times, and you saw an illustration from Dundee to Dublin recently, but I've moved several times before and had to reinvent or readjust, readapt, had to change. And I'm thinking about our generations, our transgenerational world. When you think about it and reflect about it, a moment when your parents were born, your grandparents were born, what that world looked like. When you were born, and what has happened in the last maybe 20, 30 years, how life around you has changed, how people around you have changed, people who might still be here, others might have been gone. I knew people like our youngest TED Talk member today <laughs> uh, have entered this world. So this requires a lot of adaptation, a lot of flexibility. But are our caring systems, our healthcare and social care systems, our systems that we're interacting with, are they prepared to match this diversity, this dynamic? So we're living in changing worlds and have changing lives. One of the, uh, those changes manifest themselves in the way we think of families. Still, in policy documents and strategies, we speak of family-centered, family-friendly policies, but rarely do we pause about and think about you know, what family actually means nowadays. We have greater awareness of more diverse families than ever before. Um, I saw a while back in a little metro free newspaper a clip of, I think it was around the time when um, Elton John and his partner were adopting a child, or seeking to adopt a child, 45 permutations of family. We have single parent families, we have same sex families, we have multi generational families. We have childless families, we have nuclear families, extended families, and so on. This little illustration here just shows you a patchwork of these different notions of family. Again, if we pause and think, how well are our systems geared up to match the needs of these diverse families? Another notion of change relates to community. We can think about how communities now live together, work together, the spaces they inhabit. And I'm thinking about my mom, who lives in a suburban community in Germany, um, has lived there about 40 years. She's 85 years old now. And a lot of things have changed in that community. When she moved in, there were a lot of families of probably the same age. Um, there were. Um, uh, a lot of traditional farm, uh, farmers still in the community active. And she was welcomed, she was, um, become, became quickly a part of the, fam of the community. Now in the last 10 years, uh, families, uh, older family members have moved out of the community or have died. Um, children, like me, have moved on, have moved abroad. Um, the neighbors are new. The social support structures and social environments that she is confronted with is completely different now than it was 30 years ago. But now she needs those social connections. Now she needs those links. But they're hard to find. People drive into the city to do their shopping. The local shop that used to cater for immediate needs like milk, potatoes, and so on, closed down. It was not sustainable anymore. That is the shop she could reach. She doesn't use the internet. She doesn't believe the internet. She's not a digital 
immigrant or digital native, as we call it, but she predates the internet. Technology, the way we communicate, the way we access information, the way we buy things, shop for things, uh, get, um, get connected with each other, has changed dramatically in the last 20 years or so. Smartphone density is now higher in some East African countries than in parts of Germany. So it's a global phenomenon that the way we communicate has changed. People under 20 or 25, I would say, have seen now more places in this world than the older generation could ever dream of. So we're highly mobile, our workforce is highly mobile. And yet, our older uh, population, but not only them, becomes increasingly socially isolated and lonely. So loneliness is a real phenomenon. We communicate in real time more than ever before, instantly through Twitter, Facebook, and so on, but loneliness is increasing. So what do we see? We see a huge fragmentation of the way we live, the way we communicate, and also the way our services are or, uh, arranged and organized. We need to find a way to overcome this fragmentation and to reconnect the dots that are currently isolated. We operate in these silos. We try to create efficiencies in hospitals through Lean, Six Sigma, or whatever managerial mechanisms we try to Im implement. But even connecting information from the hospital to the GP becomes difficult. We have all the technology in the world, but we cannot have electronic records that follow the patient. Social care, supposedly integrated, completely different ways of capturing data, for instance, in Scotland. Several initiatives are underway to uh, rectify that, but a huge, challenging effort. And then the communities that develop, that change constantly, and the families within those communities, the ways they live, the ways they communicate, the ways they support each other. Who is the caregiver? I'm a caregiver for my mom, but I live about uh, 2,000 kilometers away. So that's a new reality that we communicate, that we need to communicate and work with. So, as I said, we are focusing very much on our structures, on making our hospitals efficient, on improving discharge. And all the data that we have show, yeah, the length of stay for many conditions have, has decreased. At the same time, we lack GPs, a massive lack of GPs, an underutilization of public health nurses, for instance, in, in Ireland. So we desperately need to reconnect the systems because at the moment they're fragmented. We're talking about clinical pathways, and that's fine. We're talking about stroke pathways, dementia pathways, but people are not just conditions, and more often than not, when you're 65 and older, you just have more than one condition to manage. You might have dementia and a stroke and a learning disability or uh, something else that uh, need to come into the picture. I think it's time to think about people pathways relationship pathways rather than clinical pathways. We need to move the power back from the professions into the public. Decision making back into people um, together with the professions, not in isolation. It's about relationships. It's about people-centeredness, community-centeredness, family-centeredness. This, these are the assets that people bring to the table. They don't live in isolation, technically. They have hobby friends, they have relatives, they have colleagues, they engage in workspaces, and so on. They, they have uh, places of worship, supermarkets they engage with, and so on. We need to think out of the box. We need to harness the complexity of these systems in order to create something that I call a flourishing system, a flourishing caring system. And I'm drawing here on this ecosystem notion, but also on concepts that come from positive psychology in terms of uh, how people flourish. And it's not rocket science, it's five components that Seligman, 
and colleagues have worked up. It's about positive emotions. It's about engagement. It's about relationships. It's about meaning. And it's about achievement. If you think about those, if we lift these systems from individual uh, from an individual component up to a system level, I think we can do it. We need to enhance connectivity engagement. And there's lots of emphasis in Scotland, in Ireland, and other places about civic engagement, public involvement. But we also need to be mindful that it doesn't become tokenism, that people are excluded from this engagement practice. If we're talking with a diverse population we need to adapt the methodologies, the methods, how we engage with people, whether it's using sign language for a deaf population, whether it's providing accessible venues for people to come to, to engage in transportation support, whether it's uh, supply, um, supplying alternative formats for reading and understanding the information for people with learning disabilities, and so on. So we need to think in terms of diversity, not only the easy to reach, easy to, easy to engage people. And it's about happiness, it's about hope, it's about positivity. When I went to Brazil a few years back um, and I visited a hospital, one thing that struck me immediately is how the caring professions interacted with each other and with the patients. There were a lot of smiles. People paused in the corridors to hug each other, asked about their day. Um, there was a lot of laughter on the bedside. There was a lot of painting, drawing, a lot of creative activity. If you were a student nurse, you were encouraged, if you were a good singer, to sing with the patients. And they did that. So they embraced this positive, holistic understanding of, well, create a good environment, a positive environment, and positive relationships, and create a hopeful environment. Create an environment that provides nourishment. A while back, we wrote a paper about dementia and trying to shift the notion away from decline to development. Things that you can discover that are in people that constantly evolve and change. If you adopt a notion of change rather than defect, decline, deficiency, if you uh, embrace a social model or a relational model rather than a deficit model or functional model. Finally, I think really important, meaning. What matters to people? We did some work on stroke um, a while back and asked really what kind of outcomes are really picked up by therapists who work in the community. And we found actually they use the same measures, the same standardized functional measures that they would use in the hospital. You know, whether someone can walk a certain distance or can pick up certain things. But does that really matter? When we ask people, yeah, it is maybe a means to an end. But what ultimately matters is being down the, down the pub with the friends, being uh, back in the dance hall to do ballroom dancing, to meet the grandchildren, to lift them up. So those things matter, but we need to ask them. We also need to understand the biographies of individuals of families, how people live, how they want to live, how they desire to live, how they've lived in the past. No need to bang on about being physically active if you've never been physically active in your life. You know, it's, you need to understand where it's coming from, where, where it's sit. If you have an athletic family, yeah, it might be uh, a no-brainer to do this after you had a stroke to encourage that physical activity. And from a health perspective, I'm not arguing from that, it might be functional but is it meaningful? And people need to have a sense of belonging um, as well and experience that. Again, a, a while back, we had a little project looking at the difference between housing and making a home. And I think it relates very much to placemaking as well as homemaking. Home is not a notion of a physicality per se. Home is something that has an emotional connotation, it has a social relational connotation. It's where people are happy, where they're connected, where they feel well. And this well-being, this feeling, feeling well, I think is essential. And lastly, we need to enable people to gain the sense of achievement. 
not necessarily, it sounds almost patronizing to say enable, because they bring a lot of assets. People bring assets, people have assets, but we need to recognize them. We need to encourage agency in people. We need to harness that agency to create the systems that will ultimately help us flourish. Thank you.